Okay, hey, let's, uh, let's go. We have, a, dude, we, we have an awesome class today. And uh, it'll help if I put my mic on. So we, I think we have a really awesome class. But I think every class is awesome. But I live in this world, of, is if you're a teacher and you, your job is to, to do whatever you do in the classroom, then I have this sense that you should think that everything you do in the classroom is really awesome. It's just like if I'm a carpenter and I'm building things out of wood, then what's the point of building stuff out of wood if I don't think what I'm building is awesome? You, you know what I mean? Like, like I want someone to have it. I'm going to build it because I think someone should have it. And so I think today's class is uh, it's, um, it's going to be a really interesting class going to be a cool class. Okay, so um, <laughs> so all right, man. <laughs> all right, so the title is uh, Critical Race Theory, also known as Sociology. And I'm going to make the argument today that what is in essence critical race theory. Not what people think it is or what they imagine it to be or whatever the case is. Um, but what, is, what it is in essence is sociology. It's sociology 101, in fact. And, uh, and in that sense, it's everything that I do and have been doing for 31 years. I've never called it critical race theory. I don't use the I don't use the term. I the the term is it's it's a it's more of a movement than it's not. Re, there's no theory. There's no like tightly held together series of propositions that all point us in some that are sort of bounded by or buoyed by a series of hypotheses that point us in some direction to understand the world in a much more clear way. Um, it's it's not a theory in that way, it's much more a movement. And, and probably back in 1980s, people started to talk, to use this kind of critical race, like people thinking about you know, critical feminist ideology, right? Critical this, critical that, critical race understanding. And people started to begin talking about this thing called critical race theory. And again, it's kind of a movement, but it's not this coherent, set of ideas that, that we really, by and large, could all and would all agree upon. Okay, cool? So, but I'm going to give you my take on it. And hang on one second. Masks. And microphones. It's awesome, though. You just have to really hang on one second. How's that? Got it? All right, so listen. A um, couple things for me, anyway. So this, this matters at some level for me because uh, for whatever reason, I, I mentioned it earlier, um, but... For whatever reason, um, we hang on one second. Dang, man. I'm going to try to get this right. Last summer, um, some folks on the right had found some videos that we had online. It's something like, I don't know, at some point, like 1,500 videos that we've made in class, and they're online. And, uh, and some people started pulling some clips out of the videos and then deciding that they could frame a, a, a narrative around those particular clips. And one that was really popular and really common was this clip where I was talking about race inequality. And so this is an article from a conservative magazine called National Review, which I used to subscribe to, um, but about critical race theory 
what they did was they took a small portion of one side of a clip and one side of an argument that I was making, right? So for example, imagine if I say, hey, there's far more racism in the world. I'm going to introduce you all in a second, right? There's far more racism in the world or in the United States than the vast majority of Americans would care to or believe there is, care to believe there is, are interested in believing there is. There's far more racism, right? And then we leave it at that. But if I add on, and there's far less racism and far less discrimination than a lot of people, especially people on the left, believe there is and imagine there is and want to think there is. Both those things would come out of my mouth, and both are true, and I think both are true. But if you only look at one side, then you're missing the much more complex nuance of what it is that I'm talking about. And so one of the things that happened was people were putting these little video clips out and sort of sending them out, and whether it was this National Review or Fox News or this thing, this article was actually in Forbes. I don't know how it would make it to Forbes magazine, but, um, but what I'm going to do today is have a conversation about critical race theory. And I'm going to link it to sociology, and I'm going to explain the foundation of everything that we talk about in this class. And this is a class on race. It's a class on race relations. So obviously, it matters to this class. It's not the only thing that matters, but it matters to this class. So our volunteers today are three people who identify as holding more conservative ideas. Like myself, by the way. I'm a registered libertarian. I'm pretty conservative in lots of ways. So Eric, wanna, wanna, where, where are you from? And uh, you, you, you can pull this out too if you want to, just if it's easier. Hey guys, uh, my name is Eric. I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a sophomore and I'm majoring in chemistry. You're majoring in what? Chemistry. Chemistry? And when you say you're more conservative in the way you're thinking, what do you mean? Um, I would just say, like, especially, like, social issues, I'd say I'm just a little bit more conservative. Um, I guess generally on the political spectrum. You know, I'm not super far right, but I put myself right of center um, uh -huh. on most issues. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and nobody is purely far right or far mm -hmm. left or anything like that. But, okay, all right, that's cool. So, Eric, Maddie. Hi everyone, I'm Maddie. I am also a sophomore and I'm studying business management. I'm from St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, which is a very small town an hour and a half northwest of here. Um, I consider myself more Republican just because that's how I grew up. That's what my family's political views are and that's where um, a lot of my background and stuff came from. And I've put myself here at Penn State to kind of see some different views and I still kind of stand with mine. And similar to Eric, I also kind of like more right center, I would say. I can be persuaded and I will res like I respect everybody else's, but. Mm -hmm. And up where you place. live, it's very red, like your county. What's your county up in St. Mary's? Elk. Elk County, yeah, I was gonna say I thought it was Elk. That's a really red county. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you're, you know, you're just, you're part of your community, right? So you fit in with some of what I'm gonna talk about today. All right, Avi. My name is Avi Racklin. I'm a junior studying business management at the Schmiel College of Business. I'm from Freehold, New Jersey, which is a Monmouth County right in the middle of the state. I'm a registered libertarian and also have anarcho-capitalist beliefs, and I am vehemently against critical race theory. All right, awesome, man. And you guys, would you like critical race, are you, would you say you're against it, or you're like, it's not something, you're not gonna wave the flag of it. Could I just say that? You're not gonna wave the flag, all right. Awesome, man. God. Well, by the end, Avi, by the end of class, you, I want you to be in support of my version of critical race theory, right? So whatever that is. So my job is to get you all to get to the end, to say like, okay, I see what, at least I see what you're saying. And I understand what you're saying. And yeah, and ideally in my world, that means, oh, and it makes a lot of sense because I'm a teacher, right? So like, I, I, want to ha I want to say things that make a lot of sense. And so also there are people in this class who 
misunderstanding so-called critical race theory, and you're on like the far left, and you you don't you don't get it. Like you you're you know you're people who are just making some random arguments, and you don't have, you don't have any idea what you're talking about, right? So like me, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about most of the time. All right, man. So listen, let's do. First off, we're gonna take a break here really fast, Lily. Let's do top hat. So get just get your phones out. We're gonna do that. It's gonna be up for a minute and 20 seconds. Hey, and by the way, if you're in class and you do every day, every Tuesday and Thursday, it's gonna pop up on your screen that you have a quiz to take, a lecture attendance quiz. But if you're in class, you don't have to take that, obviously, since you're here. You're doing it on top hat. That's how you're getting the points. So, um, all right, man. So listen, takes you a hot second to do it, right? Everyone's got it down? Hang on, if you're, if you're watching the stream, just, just give us a second while people are figuring this out. We good? Lily, how are we rocking? Okay, y'all. Here's, here's team team conservative, okay? There are a lot more conservatives in the class, by the way, so we just grabbed you because you all uh, volunteered. So, so here's the deal. I initially started studying sociology because I was taking a class called social psychology. And in that class, I was learning about all the ways in which invisible forces were shaping my lives. And I never saw it. So I'm taking this class in social psychology. If you ever take social psych, you can take it in the psych department, you can take it in the sociology department. I happen to take it in the sociology department. And I was learning crazy things. Like how, you know, I took this class on jury selection. And I, and I read about how they did studies where they would just change the color of the paint on the wall and it would influence how jurors made decisions. Or like the shape of a table influence what happens at that table. You know, the color of a shirt that somebody wears in an interview has an impact of how they're perceived in the interview. All of these things that one would never really imagine. And for the first time in my life, I'm... I'm studying this stuff, and I'm realizing, wow, this is really fascinating. Like, I think that I'm making all of these individual decisions, all these thoughts, all these, you know, have all my way of seeing the world and understanding the world, and I think it's all about me, and, I, and I'm doing it, and I'm doing my thing, and I'm thinking, whoa, I'm in charge of my life, but what I'm learning is that yeah, to a degree, I'm in charge of my life, but there are all these other sociological factors and forces that are also at play, and I don't see them, and I don't understand them. And they're shaping even my deep psychological convictions, like my decision or a person's decision to commit self-harm, for example, which is a purely psychological decision, right? I mean, it's like if you're going to make a decision to engage in some kind of self-harm that's you that's your thought what I, what I was you know it's your inner life but what I was learning was now even that has sociological implications or origins because what we see are different rates of things like psychological actions like say self-harm in certain groups of people which means the group itself with the sociological structure of the group, like, you know, tall people versus short people, right? Because, Eric, you're, you're tall for your... How tall are you? 6'3 or something? Well, how tall? 6'6? Six, six? Damn. All right. So the way you walk through the world, right? It's just different. You have a different experience of the world than how I walk through the world. And, you know, like, you know there are certain things, like you duck down under certain doorways and all. But No, but I'm talking about other things, like really kind of deep stuff. So... I'm learning about how our lives are shaped by things that we don't see. And there are, again, there are a lot of things that we can talk about and we see, right? Like we know, you know, that if you're, you know, if you grew up in a divorced household, 
you have a different experience than if you grow up in a household that's not a divorced household. But like, okay, I get that. If you grow up and your parents both have advanced degrees and they make a lot of money or whatever, it's very different than if you grow up and both of your parents have a mental illness. I mean, these are, this is just basic, right? But sociology led me down. And it, so get, get that, like, our lives are shaped by sociological structures that we don't see. But sociology led me down other places to say, even stuff that we can't even imagine is shaping our lives. Okay? So now... This is one of those things that all I could say is take a social psychology class someday and, hey Jeff, can you get another microphone? Take a social psychology class and take a look at this. Okay, so. One series of factors and forces are associated with, say, gender. And you know, like women in this classroom are managing ways of being in the world that are just differently than men. And I'm talking about binary folks, right? Not non-binary folks. That have a different way of seeing the world and experiencing the world than men do. You're just managing different things. Another one is race, ethnicity, and culture. That like people of different racial and ethnic groups have a different experience of life and experience of the world than people of other groups. And those experiences shape them. So when I look around the room here and I see people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different races, different ancestries, and I think you're from different areas of the world or your parents are, maybe you're, you know, you're, 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 or your grandparents or somebody, different religions, different customs. It's like you just have a different experience of life than somebody of a different group. This idea that, you know, we're all one group, we're all one nation. It's like, you no, know, we are all one nation, but we're one nation built of many, many different subcultures. I happen to really be fascinated by the one nation idea, but I'm also fascinated by the subcultures. And I'm really ultimately fascinated by how it is that a person with brown skin, what the experience is of a person with brown skin versus somebody with really darkly pigmented skin versus somebody with really light skin, how they experience the world differently as they walk through life. Just fascinated by that. And for me, it's not, none of it is, it doesn't have to be negative or bad or like, oh my God, this is so terrible and always pointing out the negative stuff and the bad stuff. I'm a sociologist. I'm just deeply curious about all of it. So I'm really curious about race. And so I'm interested about the ways in which race shapes our lives such that we don't see it. And then I, unless I sit down and really talk to other people, like, you know, say you as a black woman, if I don't talk to you, if I don't really hear the kinds of things you're saying about living, about your life, about your hair, about skin products, about one thing after another, then I would never know the different ways in which you experience the world, how you experience the world differently than me. And if you don't ask me, or if you don't ask her, then you will never know how she experiences the world. And this is how it is. So this is what this class is about. And it's why I teach it, because I'm utterly fascinated by all of these issues and all these factors and forces, okay? This is critical race theory. This is the foundation of critical race theory, is to say, you know what? We all have different experiences. Race itself is a sociological construct, and it's worth looking at, analyzing, and talking about the different experiences that people have. We don't have to focus on the negative all the time. You know what I mean? Like, it just happens, y'all. And then I'm going to, I want to get some comments. So get ready, y'all, right? It just so happens that a lot of people who talk about race, they're always talking about the, 
like inequality, right? And the ways in which treatment is different and the ways in which problems occur and all of the factor, the things that are not equal and not fair. People are often talking about fairness or lack thereof because that's just the, what gets out there. This is what gets talked about. But most of the conversations I'm having that are rooted in critical race theory, meaning I'm thinking about ancestry and I'm thinking about race and I'm thinking about biological differences and cultural differences and so on. Most of the conversations I have aren't rooted in issues of fairness or lack thereof. It's just that that's this thing that kind of the media just takes hold of and just like kind of jams at us. But this class is not going to be just about that. This class is going to be about all the really fascinating things that are happening to people who have different cultures and ancestries and races and so on. Okay? That's critical race theory. This is like one of the foundational cornerstones of what would be critical race theory. That human beings have different personal experiences of the world that grow out of their sociological, the, the sociological differences or trajectories or histories of people of their groups. Okay, y'all, what do you think about that? One of the words that you were using to describe the different classes of people is you use biologically different. So my question would be is, is that, so aside from the skin color, do you believe that there's a biological difference between black people and white people? Yeah, well, it goes, okay, so first off, I'll, I will go even further. We're going to talk about this later in the class. Like, so there are going to be a lot of things that you all talk about that I'm not going to, I won't dodge the question. Remember I said this earlier. There's no set number of racial groups, right? Like we can't, I can't like, I can't divide this class up into X number or Y number of racial groups. Like, because that just doesn't exist, right? Basically, you have these physiological, physical differences and you got to use some basis upon which you're going to make decisions about who belongs in one group or another group, right? But if you like look out here and look at all the brown people in this room, like where are they going to go? Like if we just use skin, for example, right? And I think you would agree with us. If we lined, the, lined everybody up in a straight line and the person with the most darkly pigmented skin that's, you know, that is tint almost like has a blue tint to it, right? And then you go, oh, you just line everybody up and you go to the most lightly pigmented skin. I mean, somebody, a white person with no skin pigmentation whatsoever. They, their skin is almost translucent. You can see through the skin to see their veins. And their way at that end, and now we got to divide that line of people, which is all these people in this room, into racial groups. It's like we couldn't do it, right? So it's like, so race then becomes this sort of confluence of ancestry, geography, sociology, biology, ethnicity, all of these things that come together. And then, and then in a certain sense, it's meaningless. And it is meaningless. And if it were up to me, I would, I would stop using the term. And mostly I talk about ancestry. So, but we'll get to that later. That's an awesome question. How about you? Um, Don? Yeah, okay. I think if I had been introduced to like critical race theory um, in the definition that you provided, that would have, I would have had a more positive viewpoint of it. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, the idea that the races are kind of interconnected and um, connected to the way that we go through life and the relationships that we have, all that stuff. Uh, I'm okay with that. Like, that makes sense to me. Um, I think just the, the de maybe the definition of critical race theory has been lost in society today just, yeah. be just because of how um, it's being portrayed in the news. And, like, I, I don't agree with how um, it's being applied to, like, the education system, but um, the definition you kind of gave made sense to me. Well, you know, so, for example, when I give talks to to eighth graders or you know sixth graders seventh graders eighth graders right and i talk about our bodies and differences in our bodies and how and why we have different shaped noses and eyes and texture of hair and you know all sorts of things right and i talk about the different historical experiences that groups have and i speak to a 14 a 12 or a 13 year old or whatever but not like anti-white condemning white people can all this kind of stuff which is like how i got perceived this past summer, which is like, come on, man. Like, that's just the absurdity of that, right? So if I do that and I say, isn't it awesome to look across the room and see people 
to know that people have different experiences than you and are different from you and like you we can share those experiences you know like when i'm tr- on the other side of the planet and i'm with people that are just of a complete have a completely different biological foundation of their lives let alone sociological cultural etc to me it's utterly fascinating right and it doesn't have to be negative and we're always like you know beating it down but but that's the that's the world out of which critical race theory emerged and it partly emerged because in in white people so let me say to the three of you it partly emerged as this thing where this way of understanding the world that you had to like really convince white people that this is real that black and brown people have a different experience of the world than you all white people do so like come on listen to us and and if white people had simply the sociologists who thought who think like i think which is like well of course they have different experiences of the world of course you do just like tall people have different experiences than short left-handed people when you walk into a room like this and you're left-handed you every room you walk into you're you already know where the left-handed desks are and if you don't know that already they're on this side of each one of these rows and if you're left-handed you know where the left-handed desks are in 100 thomas and you know your whole life you know you're managing being left-handed constantly it's just it's not a bad thing it's not like oh poor left-handed people no you're just managing that you're thinking about it it's part of who you are maddie yeah, so I really agree with, with like what Eric had to say. Um, I think like society definitely construes this idea that like critical race theory is like all negative and it's bad. And I've personally never heard of critical race theory in a positive sense. So just like hearing about um, being able to like listen to different experiences and all the positives that do come about it, I think like is going to be really cool and something different. Okay. Yep. Okay. Cool. We're also going to talk about some of the negative stuff, right? I mean, that, that, you, you also got to talk about that. But, but it's not just that. And, and it wouldn't be just negative if people were more were listening to it. But okay, let's go, to the, let's go to the next thing. So the other thing that's really important is, as a sociologist, I'm always talking about groups. I'm not interested in individuals. I'm interested in groups. So in that article in the National Review, what happened was I had somebody kind of stand up and said, look, this, I talked about group experiences, and then I had the person stand up. Can you stand up really fast? All right. So I talked about, what's your name? Jesse. Here, Jesse? Here, just turn around. So I talked about the group experience of being white and certain experiences to just whiteness. Every white person's different, right? Where are you from? New York. New York, New York State, New York, like New York, like outside of New York, outside New York City. Okay, is your family? What class are you from? Middle, middle class, middle class outside of New York City, right? She, she has a, she has her own experience of the world. She's not living in a trailer in in rural Nevada or something. But you're white, and so me, I'm talking about the experience, just whiteness, and but then I had somebody like Jesse stand up, and who was the kid that was in that video and I said look so this guy here his name was Russell so he'll be like you Jesse here's let me let me just put some things together about an average white person in the United States and here it is and I walk through and like but that's a really hard thing to do because Jesse is uh we only know two things about her right you're from outside of New York City you're middle class and you're at Penn State three things about you but there's so many things about her like we don't know like i we you and i we could talk for an hour and it would we'd barely get to there right so like what's what can i say about you about white people that it would all be embodying you nothing right okay thanks jesse okay so the issue is when you're doing sociology y'all right we try to stay away from the ends of the bell curve we kind of we're, we're talking about sort of the norm of it in a certain sense right and then when we're getting into the norm, like main statements of white people or Muslims or Buddhists or Indians or whatever the case is, we're, we're, we're making these sort of generalizing statements. But if we don't do that, we can't have a conversation about anything, any group. Any group you talk about, you're going to make generalizations. You just want to be pretty good at how you do it and the ways in which you make the generalizations and don't push it too hard. And I'm going to give you an, ex- I'm going to give you an example of this. 
okay, that I think is really valuable. Bro, can you go to the next? Can I, can I get like, can I get, I, I need, can I get five volunteers really fast? And, and it's going to be really ideal if you're all of African ancestry, just for a second. So we have one, two, can I just get five, I just need five black people, three, four, and I need one more. So anybody, it doesn't really matter. Bro, can I get you? College engineering, yeah. You, you don't even have to talk, you just got to look pretty. Yeah, okay, here, come down. Yeah, just come down for a second. Just stand up. Here. I want, I want to show you this. Wait, bro, you're off the hook, man. I'm not, we're, I'm just going to have, I'm not going to ask your names or anything for right now. This is not, this is a, just a demonstration thing. So here, stand here and stand right there. Here, even out. Okay, right there, right here, right here. Okay? Nice sandals, by the way. Damn. All right. Yo, get a shot of her sandals. Those are rocking. So listen, let me show you this. Turn, turn around here. and Look, this is... <laughs> this is black... <laughs> this is black... Well, and this is black Americans, okay? Now, it's, a, it's Africans, it's Afro-Caribbeans, it's African-Americans... It's all, all people who identify as of having African ancestry, okay? It's broken up into deciles, so 10, but we're going to squeeze them together. So you're, you are the richest 20% of black people. You're the, the richest next 20% of black people. You are the next, the middle richest 20%. Then you are the poorest 20%. Here, move down just a little, right? And you're the second poorest 20%, okay? Got it? So now imagine right here, in this bag right here, I have all black wealth. Every black person in the United States, I have all of their money right here. Okay? Got it? So it's all right here. And I'm going to distribute it to the, the to, I'm going to distribute it out. And then here's the amount of money that's going to go to the richest 20% of black Americans. The second 20%, you get your share you get your share, you're in the middle, and you're, you're the second poorest, and then the poorest 20%. Okay, you got it? So I've distributed all of black wealth here in the United States. This is how it gets distributed. You know, like, rich people have a lot more than poor people and so on, right? You, the richest 20%, controls 90%. She controls her group. So these are, these are the richest 20% of black people in the U.S., control 90% of all black wealth. It's like, damn. Damn. Like, it's the same with white people, by the way. The richest 20% of white people control 90% of all white wealth. It's the same thing. Then the second, and you control the second richest 20%, control 7.2%, about 7% of all the black wealth. And then we start getting down here and we say, well, no, hang on, not 7.2. It's like 11, it's going to be 10.3, 10.2, right? 10.1. Okay, so 10%. And then here we're at 5 and 6, so we're at like 2.5%. You control 2.5% of all black wealth. You have nothing at all. The poorest 40% of black Americans virtually have no wealth. But the richest 20% of black Americans control 90% of all the wealth that exists in the black community. Okay, you're following this, right? So when if I want to make a statement about black people, who am I talking about here? Who am I talking about? If I want to talk about the oppression of black people, who, who am I talking about the oppression of black? Is, am I talking about her, these people down here? Or these people in this group? Or these people down here? If I'm talking about you know what I mean? And if I want to compare black people to white people or black people to Asians, who am I going to, what am I going to compare? Am I going to compare black people down here to white people up here? Like, who am I, who am I, what am I talking about? And so when you do sociology, 
you're always thinking about these kind of factors and forces, right? Which group is it? Like, the really rich people? The really privileged people? Because if we just start talking about black people as being, like, lacking privilege compared to white people, it's like, ooh, hang on a second. Her? How about just the richest 10% that controls three-quarters of all the wealth? That's some serious privilege here. If we're going to just look at wealth... So you understand, sociology becomes this thing where it's really difficult to do because you're always trying to figure out who you're, are you comparing apples to oranges or apples to apples or oranges to oranges or what are you doing or how are you doing it? And so that's what we're doing all the time. Okay, is that cool? So critical race theory, if we just start talking about black people as like, oh, well, you know, the the, uh, white power and white this and white that and black exclusion and black oppression and white fragility i don't know all these things that we throw around who, who are we talking about who who is it and that's why when you talk about this stuff you got to be really careful about what it is you're saying and how you're saying it because talking about these folks is really different than talking about these folks right here very different world and then you've you got lots of Latinos or Latinx and Asians or white people who are also down here. And you're going to, what, compare these people to those up here? You see how it is? You see, like, where this stuff gets really discombobulated? Bad people who are not doing this very well and just throwing around these terms like critical race theory and this and that. It's like, you got to account for shit like this. And if you're not accounting for it, then you're not doing anything that's very interesting and valuable. Okay. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thank you. Is that cool? You see that, you see that, right? You see how it starts to get complicated? You all, do you have any questions? You gonna... all should really appreciate that right there. Well, I mean, what you did was very educational and informative. However, I don't believe that what you just did was critical race theory. Well, it, no. Dude, yes. I agree with you. It's not critical race theory. How most, that's not where most people would start who are talking about critical race theory. It is sociology of race. It has to be included in all of these conversations that we're doing. But if you were to ask people about, hey, give us your like 10 minute or 15 minute spiel about critical race theory, that wouldn't be part exactly, of it. Exactly, that, that they, would not be it. Yeah, they wouldn't be saying like, hey, well, wait, what are you talking about here? Are you talking about rich people, poor people? Da, 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 da. No, uh, no, it's not part of it, but that's all part of it. And that's what you get in this class. It's very complicated. It's a whole semester of complication. Do you have any, anything? Um, do you have? Yeah, I mean... I guess that's probably also not what I would think of when I first think of cr- critical race theory, you know, but I, what you said makes sense to me um, overall, so. And okay. I think, like, it's really important to, like, point that out because, like you said, it's not something that people think about when you start talking about this topic. Like, you don't start thinking about, like, how really you can apply that to any race and it's going to be the same thing where it depends, like, what um, portion of the people that you're talking about when you're comparing them. Okay, so here, right, yes. People all have unique, people have unique histories. And within those histories, within that group, they share lots of things. But people also have very different history. Like, for example, the history of white immigrants in the United States. Every single white immigrant group, so especially if you're from Southern Europe, right, like Polish and you know, I, or, or even, Northern, even okay, Northern Europe because of the Brits. I mean, it doesn't, there, there are certain, every group that came into the United States was shat upon in some way by the groups that came before it, right? You bring group, you bring people in because you want to exploit their labor somehow. So all these white ethnic, white cultures that came in the United States, they, you know, they were brought in to exploit their labor. I mean, it's the nature of it, right? Okay, but then at some time, they all became white. They weren't white. There was the German race, the Polish race, the Italian race, the Irish race, and that's how we talked about it. But then at some point, they all become white. It's like, whoa, hang on, what happened to white people? Where did white people come from? Like, how'd they get white? And now that's a unique, really fascinating history that's different than other black and brown people. So now we have to look at that. So this is, a, it's all just a really comp, okay. Anyway, go to the next slide. So here. 
critical race theory and sociology, right? Um, race and ancestry continue to be salient, meaning important, in the world. People who make arguments about critical race theory, you wouldn't be talking about critical race theory. I wouldn't teach this class if I didn't think that our ancestry and, our, and, our, and, our, and, our, and the, the origins of different, the biological origins of certain groups, if I didn't think it had some value to talk about. Like gender, right? Like I, I wouldn't, I would, I talk about gender because I think that men and women have different experiences of the world. I talk about LGBT issues a lot because I think it, it's utterly meaningful in people's lives. And so like, okay, so we talk about it. So that's the critical race piece, all right? So here, go to the next slide. Now, what do we do with that, right? Well, one of the things that we talk about a lot is, remember, inequity and inequality, right? That's just the thing that's endlessly talking about, like inequality, 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 right? Because that's what really drives people to want to talk about. Now, mind you, Black and brown people don't sit around talking about inequality all day long, really. I've been in conversations with rooms full of black and brown people where it barely comes up because people are talking about other things. It's like, come on, man. It's not, it's not the only thing. But, you know, it is what gets driven. It's what gets put out into the world a lot. And oftentimes in a class like this, that's the thing that will lead the conversation. But when you get going in the conversation, it's not just about that. But nonetheless, that's a big part of this critical race theory. So then, you know, we want to say like, okay, how do we know? We know there's a certain amount of inequality, right? That we know. There's more than a lot of people think there is. There's less than other people think there is. Okay, we, that we know. I can make that statement. That's like, is that, that's just, I mean, how can I not, how can I go wrong with that? You know what I mean? <laughs> Basically, I've said nothing. But whatever, but it's all good. We could just ask people, and then these are the responses we got. This Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We could say, like, well, hang on, tell us. How much discrimination do you, do you experience? But that's pretty meaningless, right, for obvious reasons. What's that really say? What, do you, what are we talking about? Right? You would argue that's pretty meaningless. What, that... You, they were surveyed people? Yeah, like, yeah, you're just going to survey people, ask them, have you experienced you discrimination? Just, you, you, look, you just randomly ask people, you know, of certain groups, and you say, have you been discriminated against? And you say yes or no. Yeah, and it's like, well, what do you mean discriminated against? What are we really talking yeah. about? How is that? There's no what additional context to that poll aside from No, that. there's no context to it. So therefore, we have to say, oh, but that doesn't mean we throw it out. Because now we're still studying really carefully and deeply analyzing. You know, so you can do st things like that, but that has no meaning. Like, you can't just ask somebody, you know what I mean? Like, oh, do you? Oh, okay, so therefore it's true, because you think it's true. Hey, bro, is doing hallucinogenic mushrooms a really good idea for everybody? Everybody should do it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so he thinks it is. Like, okay, therefore it is, right? Because he thinks it is, right? Do you think it is? Dude, she's not going to follow you on that, so, like, whatever. Follow this guy. Are you kidding me? He's got the truth. All right. So here we go. Let's go to the next. Let's go. You're going to talk about it one day, bro. Here. Go to the next. So one of the other pieces. Are you guys, do you have any questions for me yet? Do you have any questions? I guess my question would be is, is that, you know, because critical race theory, the way that the definition is, as far as the majority of people understand it, is not what we're going over right now. The critical race theory, to as a definition, is basically setting up a totem pole of victimhood, and that's not what we're doing here. Yeah, so there is no, let me see, here's part of the problem for people like me. There is no definition of critical race theory. There really isn't. There are certain groups of people, whether it's the, the a media here or a writer there or whatever, that decides they're going to define it. But what I do... What I've been doing for 31 years in this class is critical race theory, meaning that I'm, I'm taking the, the bag of all the issues related to race and culture and ancestry, and I'm like pulling stuff out of the bag and looking at it and saying like, hey, what, you know, what is this? Right? So the way that I described it to you, what would you call that 
educators who do that in the classroom, teach it to their students, who teach them about totem poles and victimhood and oppression. If that's not critical race theory, what yeah, would you call that? I would call that people who have a very superficial understanding of politicized ideas, and then they want to, they feel like they're going to just put that out into the world somehow. First off, most people, teachers or anybody, shy away from talking about race in any way, shape, or form. Because people, especially white people, because you don't want to say the wrong thing. So most people aren't talking about it. They might be like, well, my 15-year-old students, you should really learn about critical race theory because, you know, black people and Native Americans and Chicanos and Chinese at the you know, in the 19th and early 20th century, are oppressed. But, like, they're not saying anything. It's nothing. All it is, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, uh, it's like a wrestling match. It's like a jello wrestling match or something, right? That from the outside, it looks really fascinating, but nobody's really doing it. Who wrestles, who does jello wrestling, you know what I mean? But we all know about it, and we think about it, and we have opinions about it, but no one ever really does it. So not many people are actually doing that. And it's very few people who are really doing it in a very thoughtful way. But most, peop most people are not. Most people shy away from it because they're afraid, dude. Yeah, I would say that. But I would say it's shallow, politicized, unreflective understanding of race issues. Would you call it racism? I think a lot of it is. It's, I was accused of being racist, of hating white people right? Like, this was the thing all summer. It's like, dude, I got 500 emails of people that are just like, fuck you. You hate white people. You're, you know, every name in the book. I got called a douchebag in eight different ways, right? But the, I, I mean, you can spell it lots of different ways, but whatever, right? Like, I just like, it's like, what are you, why are you, what are you doing? Like, there's a perception that some people do that. I don't do that. But some people, especially like people who want to be cool, they want to be hip, right? So they want to be like, especially white people who want to be hip. Yeah. But most, I would say most people in my position are more thoughtful about it. I would say that. Can I but ask here. a question real quick? What's oh, that? I was going to ask a question. Go ahead. So like, do you think that if we were to redefine critical race theory, kind of how you're talking about it, do you think it's still something that should be taught to, do you think kids in ele like elementary school are mature enough to like understand this still? Or yeah, do you well, think it's like a... Yeah, well here, like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna teach something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a quick lesson in the origin of the United States, mm -hmm. okay? And you, at the end of it, you tell me, if you had kids, you tell me at what age you would want them to hear what the story that I am telling, okay? So this will be really awesome. Man. Beautiful. So look, y'all, go, go to the next slide. One thing that's really notable about, first off, the United States is an amazing place. You, you can talk about the U.S. as being like, uh, you know, it's like all the, the slavery and the genocide and the this and the that. It's like, look, man, I study these issues globally all over the world. The United States isn't it for all the, the bad that has happened here, and, I, and I'm going to talk about some of it in a second. This is the most amazing experiment in human social relations. The fact that this country exists, continues to exist, that we've had a mostly peaceful turnover of power every four years, and that we've only had one civil war is unbelievable. That doesn't negate all the negative, the genocide and the slavery that was just like really un unknown at this certain stage in human history, lots of different things, but it's really amazing, right? So now, but let's look at what got created here. This was the first system, major system, a, 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 a government, a social system that was built around the stratification of people on the basis of biological characteristics. That people on their way to the Americas, first off, they came here to the Americas, this land was populated. There were people living here all through the Americas, the indigenous peoples. And the people that came were seeking something new. 
And eventually, over the course of time, uh, what was essentially a genocide happened of the indigenous peoples living here, right? I mean, you can only call it a genocide. Some of it was deliberate, some of it was not deliberate, but the point was, it's like, get off the land because now this is going to be our land and we've decided we can't live with you because we've created a story in our minds that you are barbarians and you are less than human and therefore, to all the American Indians here, we're not going to live with you. That on the way to the, they had this idea that, hey, we're going to go to Africa, we're going to get groups of people and we're going to bring them here to this new land we're going to own them. We're going to force them to work for us. And we're going to do it on the basis of their physical characteristics. And we're going to build a stratification system only on the basis of those physical characteristics. Slavery has been a part of the world forever. It's, there are more slaves in the world today than at any point in human history. Slaves are cheaper than at any point in, in human history. You can go to countries of the world and buy a slave for $10. There, there's, you know, 30 to 40 million slaves in the world today. It's a, the, the, the treatment is just un, ungodly, unbearable, right? It's always been, but this was the first time that somebody built a system around in the way that they did. And they put it in place and they stratified it and they built an entire legal, binding legal structure around slavery and how to treat indigenous peoples who are already here. It's like, whoa. When you do that, so now I'm thinking as a sociologist, right? When you do that, you've now created a system that is going to influence human behavior forever. Forever. Because you can't, you can't just, one, you don't just snap your fingers one day and say, as we did, you know, and mostly in, so let's say 1865 or whatever, right? If we want to use that as the date. But you don't just snap your fingers and one day the people who were less than human are suddenly human. It doesn't happen that way. So, so given that, and so this is my question to you, that's part of the story of the United States. That's part of so-called critical race theory, part of the sociology of understanding groups and how that happened and how that has continued to impact us right up to today. How could it not? You can't, you can't have 350 years of that and have it not still be part of this system. Like, it just, it did. We've come so far. We have, yo, y'all, we have come so far. And I hear sometimes people on the left who are talking about race, I hear them like say, oh, we haven't made any progress in 300 years. I'm like, fuck, are you kidding me? That's just, that's stupid, right? That's just so, like, we have made, that just comes from a person who doesn't study history at all. We have come so far, and yet we are still impacted by all of this stuff. Now, what age would you want your kid to start hearing that story of the United States? The one that's really cool, all the, this, this amazing country, like, oh my God, how well we actually get along, because we really do. It's all relative, but we really do. And how much we've influenced, we're continuing to be influenced by our past. How, when would you want your kid to start learning that? Um, I mean, if they could under, you know, they're in return to understand some of those concepts, yeah, like, early, like, sure, but like, I think there's a little bit of a, a problem with, um, let me think of how to word this. With, if you're saying that you know, the original system, obviously it's bad. I don't think anyone disagrees yeah. with that. And of course, there's like there's traces of that today. But I, I just don't agree with the way that a lot of times today people are saying, yeah, this original system was so bad. And it still rings true today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That, that's where I deviate from you as well. No, no, listen. They, it, and that's coming from people who don't study who don't study history. They don't know about it. Because if you were to make a statement like that, that's like saying that's like. I mean, that, that's just like that's so silly to be to be even worth contemplating. It's still the same today. Like, no, it is not. Please, I'm not saying it's the same today. But you said that. No, no, no. You're not. No, no, no. But some people you're saying that. But some people say that. But you're saying that the system previously still rings true today. Uh, no, what I'm saying is it's still 
the structure that was built for you know over three centuries is still impacting the ways in which human beings live that we're living our lives today the sociology of the system it still is impacting the, the sociology of, of what left over like what's that G jim crow's gone right we don't have okay, slavery okay, none of this Dude. So it's like... oh f awesome all right do you have a question i'm gonna i'm gonna explain that okay no i don't have a question but i do kind of want to like say an answer okay um, go ahead Give yeah an so i want to i think that we should like teach our kids at a young age about this but i think that like growing up and going all through like grade school and elementary school a lot of it's all hounded on how bad it was and yes it was absolutely terrible but i think that just as much as you say how bad it is i think that there should be equal teaching as to how it's getting better to quickly answer your question, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. just to quickly answer your question in regards to what we should teach, I'm all for teaching history. Yeah. We should teach people about slavery. We should teach people about the Japanese internment camps, all yep. of that stuff. I'm all for textbook history. However, when the, where we deviate is when we talked about it ringing true today, that I would not get into because okay. I believe that's not actual history. Okay, well, here. Are you ready? Okay, I got that. That's good. But here's what I would say. I'm not, pulling the, I'm not pulling a power card here on you, okay? Like, I'm really not. I'm going to show you something, but I'm not, pu I'm, not gonna, I'm not pulling a power card. This is something I've been studying deeply for now 35, almost 40 years, studying, studying the sociology of power and econ economics and so on and so forth, right? Now, I used to be really radical left, and I used to be really, eh, not radical left, but I used to be much more ignorant and much more willing to just critique power and just critique whatever it is, rich people and the U.S. and foreign policy and white people and men or whatever the case is, right? But then at some point in time over the years, I started to get really much more thoughtful. I realized, you know, you're, you're really sounding like an idiot. So, like, why don't you get a little more thoughtful? Why don't you actually use your sociological analysis to carefully deconstruct the world and understand the world? And they're like, oh, okay, why don't I do that? Why don't I know, start with the idea, right? Start with the idea that racism is everywhere. Now I just got to prove, I got to show all my students why it is everywhere. What if I just start with the idea, huh, let's explore, let's see whether it really, how much it actually exists. And then once we start there, then now we're in a different place, right? So, okay, bro, we're going to go with, Go with this, this slide right there. Okay, here. Let me walk you through a couple things, right? So in, in, in 1865, 18, you know, 18, let's just say 1865, the Civil War is over. You don't, you, we didn't, there was nothing, you couldn't just build a new system. You didn't just build a new system, right? Like, you just didn't do that. It wasn't like, dude, these are, these are, Look, you got a society of people who think that people of African ancestry are closer to monkeys than to human beings. At the end of the Civil War, you don't have television, you don't have radio, you have nothing. At the end of the Civil War, what do you think? Like people just one day said, oh, okay, they won the war now. Lincoln has decided they're freeing the slaves, uh, which happened a few years earlier. And like, okay, now, okay, I'm going to change my thinking now. That didn't happen. In fact, a system got built that in many ways was worse than the slave system. And it goes right up into 1964, which is the Civil Rights Movement. Like, all these signs are just kind of signs that are part of Jim Crow. You know, no, no coloreds, no black people, no Mexicans, no, no Indians, no Chinese. No one thing after another, right? It's just kind of like, whoa, this is system of white supremacy. But it was also no Polacks. No Irish, no diff different white racial, quote, racial groups were also put down. But it's not, a, you don't get up until 1964 when you start breaking down all these laws, like at a federal level, which says, no, we're going to demand that you all have to start getting a law. That's 1864. That's 345 years, you all, like 345 years. It's like, whoa. Like, dude, 1964, I was born in 1960 when these wall, all these walls start getting broken down. 
Okay, so now let me, let me show you. This is really important. Go to, go to the next piece. Here's net wealth in the United States. So you take all of your, all of your, um, your assets, and you subtract all your debt, and then you add up what you have left. That's your net wealth, and this is median wealth. And so this is, you know, from the U.S. Federal Reserve, this is 2016. Look at white net wealth. It's like 100. These are families, okay? 170,000 dollars. And then you look at black net wealth, equal Hispanic net wealth. This, this is the reason that's so low, Native Americans, is because 345 years of white people, and again, don't forget, I'm not, I'm not disallowing or I'm not, not talking about all the different white ethnic groups that held each other down, right? Because this is really important. But 345 years of a head start. Like, Damn. But look at well the Asians are doing, especially no, that, after ah, internment camps and stuff like no, that. No, no, but that no, the, the Asians are. See, here, here you go. Asians are most of the new Asian immigration coming to the United States are educated people, more educated people, and people with money, just like Africans. Like if we look at Africans, by the way, remember the twenty percent up here. Most of most of most Africans, you know, especially new immigrants to the United States, they're in the twenty percent category up here. So new Africans, like you, you come to the, you don't come to the U.S. Most Africans coming to the U.S. are coming with money and education. Same with Asians. So that number right there, you got, you have like a population of Asians who are really struggling, and then a population of Asians who are doing really, really well. And so they're coming with money, they're coming with education, they're coming. So that almost like I, I almost have to set that aside. We'll talk about it later. But but look I think at it's that. An, I think it's important to note though. No no no, I know, but dude. That will do three classes on Asians, but right now that's not the one that's the most salient because you understand, like that's so complex, right? So look, blacks and Hispanics, if, if, you, if, you're, if you, you can't climb the ladder, what, you, what, what's gonna happen with white people in like 30 years? What's gonna happen with that white bar? It's gonna, it's gonna increase, right? It's gonna double, let's say. So, uh, but are you saying that that's a bad thing, that white people are getting more wealthy? No. Are you trying to pose no. that question? No. Okay. But what it is is that my ancestors, and like you, let's just say your ancestors. Let's just say we're not recent immigrants, right? Yo, hang on, hang on. Dude, you, this is like, you're, you're asking the most awesome question, by the way, right? It's not a bad thing, but, but it is a thing that is built upon other people not having the same opportunities. Because if black people, if it wasn't for the 345 years, those bars would be very similar. But I would like to see right after slavery was abolished how those bars would differentiate. Because if you think about it, if you think about some of the richest white people in America, like yeah. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, I mean, yeah. these people are providing services, products for hundreds of millions of people, not just yeah. both in America and worldwide. So whereas with slavery, we were stealing from African Americans, now we are at a point of it's voluntary. So these different racial groups are voluntarily giving their money to the rich white people, yeah, yeah, but yeah, at the same it. time, they're getting products from Amazon. They're no, getting Teslas. On. No, you know, no, so. Hang on. Yeah, okay, I got it. Now you're going down a different path. It's like, we, this is gonna, this is one of those places where you can't, you don't go down that path. Just stay with where I'm, just stay with where I'm at, okay, for a second. And I'm not trying to shut it down. I'm just telling you, you, you got it. This is the fundamental point here, right? Okay, listen up. So we can agree that if, if, if we went, if, if Africans were brought here, if, if Na indigenous Americans, Native Americans were treated differently, if, Mex if Latinos were treated, everything, right? Those bars would be basically the same. Are we in agreement with that? If we had a system that was based on not a race-based inequality, but it was based on fairness and let the individuals who want to work really hard rise to the top and those who don't, they don't rise to the top. And we would see lots of black and brown people rise to the top and lots of white people go under and so on. But we would see those bars would be basically the same. Are we in agreement? I mean, I would argue that there's also a different culture at play with each. No, hang on, hang on. I know there are different cultures, but hold on. Probably less likely than you would imagine, because black people and brown people are just as capitalist in their orientation as everybody else. But I hear that. But I'm. But what I'm looking at is this, dude. 
$170,000 versus less than $20,000. From my perspective as a sociologist, that is, you cannot understand today, these are these numbers today, you can't understand those differences if you don't look at 345 years of a racist institutional, as a, a, a system that is built around racist institutionalized inequality. Like you can. It doesn't mean every single piece of it. It doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that. There were still rich black people, rich brown people. But like you cannot understand those numbers today if you don't look at 345 years. You have to also look at other things. Bro, you got to look at other things like culture, for example. But right now, it's a long semester. There are lots of things to look at. Right now, I just want to look at this. And that's critical race theory. This is me saying like, yeah, this stuff matters today. It still matters. Because all these white people, it's like, listen, it's, it's like, here, can, can, you, can you stand up really fast? Just look at the, watch this, right? Can you just, so this is the ladder of upward mobility. You're at $20,000, okay? So turn, turn toward me, watch this. And I'm at $170,000. And now she's going to work really hard because the goal is, she needs, what's, what's your name, by the way? Janae. Janae. Yeah. So Janae, listen, you don't have, you, you, your people, you represent all black people, right? Got it? You, Janae, represent all black people in the United States. Rep, represent, present well, my friend. Hi. So black people, your job is to climb the ladder of upward mobility. Work hard. Pull yourself up by your boots. Do whatever you got to do. But you got to go up there. Because you need, you need to be equal with white people. Okay? Me, I'm white people. So watch what happens. Janae's going to work really, really hard because she's going to catch up to the white people. Right? Because this is what it is. Catch up. Because you got 345 years, Janae, of like being held back because it's like this. The racist system, my conservative friends, is like this. So here, turn around. So, Janae, go ahead and climb. The racist system is this. It's going to hold her back. Okay, but the racist system doesn't exist anymore. So hold tight. All right. Okay, so Janae, start, start walking. Oh, but watch what happens. But I'm walking too. I'm walking too. She's pulling herself higher. Okay, hang on. She's working hard. She's doing what she needs to do, but so am I. Like, I'm not just sitting around waiting like, hey, you know what I mean? Janae, we got, we had a break for 345 years, right? So why don't y'all just catch up to us? No, we're going to do the same thing. So I'm doing it. And so the problem is 345 years of a, of a so-called, of policies and ideologies that said that Janae was inferior to Sam, to, to, to her people are inferior to my people. When you build a whole system around that, then what that means is that there's no way she's, there, she's never going to catch up. She, you might as an individual, right? You're here at Penn State. But it's a whole system. All right, thanks, man. You're welcome. Yo, Dude, Sam. Do you see that? Sam, do you see that? We got an Hey, do the top hat thing, by the way. Okay, you all, you get the last, last comment. Do you see, that's, a very, that's a very simple thing. What do you think about that? I'm going to start with Eric. Yo, hang on. Yo, yo, yo. You do can't not oh. leave. Oh, 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 shit. Dude. Kim, can you hold your thoughts? Yeah. First off, final thought. Just final thought. Go ahead. Ten seconds. Yeah. Um, I'd say I'd say overall, you know, I think the past 340 whatever years, um, you know, caused the inequality. I would agree with you on that. And I think in order to, you know, uh, given that they're never going to be equal, at least not for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if they're both moving at the same rate. Yeah. And, and I think the current way of addressing this issue is not right. Like, that's kind of where the critical race theory 
that yeah, we, yeah, we yeah, kind yeah, of exactly. know. That's I think that's detrimental and it's making it worse. Dude. So Okay. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to we're going to drop we're going to drop it there. We're going to come back later. Not next class. But listen, yeah, I get you have to I got to introduce you to somebody. Okay, you got it. Hey, listen up because we have an opportunity for you all. Oh, that's me. You're that out. was my cue. Okay. Uh so I've been thinking about uh, college a lot, and I've decided that you're not actually going to learn anything in college if all you do is go to lectures and take tests. So you have to seek out opportunities to have experiences and to take what you're learning and apply it before you're done. Because you don't want to get out in four years and be like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. So I have an opportunity for you, and that is to come to outdoor school where you will be a leader and a mentor for elementary school kids they're fifth grade, so they're like 10, 11 years old. They're pretty fun. And you would actually get to live at camp with them for the week. You would help them maximize their experience because they are also getting out of the classroom and having experiences that are very hands-on. Um, so I've got flyers at the back table, and I have flyers at the front table, and I'm happy to answer any questions as folks are headed out. Listen. Oh, fuck. Never mind. Go ahead. My name is... My name is... My name is... My name is... My name is...